the Vision Programming with April Tag Sessions. I'm Andy Gusser. This I'm is Dylan. Uh, I'm a Java programmer by trade and have been with the 7028 Binary Battalion since 2018. So we're going into our sixth year and I've been mentoring doing programming and control systems. Yeah, I'm Dylan. I'm a junior. I did uh, FTC for two years and this is going to be my third year in FRC. Uh, last year I was the lead programmer for the team. So April tags are basically just QR codes that the, your camera can use to detect kind of generally where it is on the field. They can be printed by any just normal printer on printer paper and it can get a 3D position of where it is on the field compared to your camera. Uh, there are 30 different ones and they're all 8 by 6 inch. Streaming for this event is brought to you by First Updates Now. We'd like to thank the following fun sponsors. SolidWorks is free for first teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SolidWorks to design great products. SolidWorks can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SolidWorks.com slash first to register your team. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. And these are just some pictures of off of the field at uh, one of the preseason events. And we just ran them through after we got back and this is just an example of what it looks like. Uh, so some reasons why April tags are have benefits over reflective tape. Uh, you don't have to have the LEDs of a limelight so you're not blinding yourself while you're programming it. Um, they're less susceptible to interference from like banners on the field, uh, screens behind not getting any false positives. Um, you can get a 3D position and orientation to where they are from the robot. Each tag's unique, so you can kind of guesstimate or you can actually calculate where you are on the field if you know where your camera is on the robot and where the tag is on the field. Each tag's unique and you don't really need to calibrate your pipeline at the competition as much. Uh, so Photon Vision, is, it works kind of like the Limelight software where you can just go through, you can edit your pipeline, it runs on the Raspberry Pi, Limelights, and Glowworm. Uh, they can identify April tags, reflective tape, and colored shapes, and Photon Library makes it easy to integrate with robot, con robot code compared to other solutions. So for hardware, um, you can use a Pi camera, you can use live cams, uh, 720p ELP camera. Um, you can, for coprocessors, you can use a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4, uh, Limelight or Glowworm. For the, the Raspberry Pi, we would recommend a Raspberry Pi 4 for April tags or color shape tracking. Other coprocessors that run Java and CS Core may work, like a Jetson or maybe a mini PC if you have that. And for a driver cam, you can also use the same as the other cameras and uh, fisheye cameras. Uh, so getting started with Photon Vision, um, you can flash the Photon Vision image onto your device. For Limelight and Glowworm, you do it via the USB and import the hardware config. For a Raspberry Pi, you just have to flash it to a micro SD card, and you need to update the jar to the latest version, and then you configure your pipeline. You want to talk about how it's a little easier to update than the um, um, So I was just going to mention here, it, it's it's nice you can update it without having to reflash it. Where if you've used the limelight before, you have to connect and flash it, and it takes a couple minutes, and then you have to re-import your configuration. Photon Vision has an offline update capability that you can just upload the jar and it updates itself. You don't have to re-import the configuration. So I thought that was a cool thing, feature about it. And for configuring your camera, 
Uh, first exposure, you want to have that as low as you can. The lower the better. You get less motion blur and uh, less latency. Uh, if you get it down enough, it'll like blot out uh, unneeded detail so you can get a little bit higher FPS with your camera. Um, the animation at the bottom kind of shows how uh, global shutter and rolling sh or slow rolling shutter works. Uh, for your brightness, with a uh, low you want it with low exposure and you want to increase the brightness so the image can be processed. Uh, you uh, higher brightness seems to work a little bit better with April tags and uh, for resolution, just kind of the same as with other imaging, uh, the higher resolution, lower FPS, but you can also see further and you can get more detail, but lower resolution, you process it a little faster. But lower resolution should also work fine, especially since now the April tags are lower resolution than they were going to be originally. And for tuning your pipeline, for decimating, it reduces the sampling frequency, increasing the decimate will lead to an increased uh, detection rate while decreasing the detection distance. For blur, it just blurs the image. You really only want to use it if the image has a bunch of noise on it. And for refining edges, using it with uh, decimate can increase the quality of the initial estimate. For threads, it just is operating on more threads on your actual CPU. Uh, the max error bits, the number of bits on a tag that need to be corrected to identify it. A uh, higher value means that more tags will be detected while a lower value reduces false positives. Uh, use zero for the tag 16 H5, which is the one that we use now, at, or for the FRC. Higher number makes sense with a higher resolution camera, and if you're running the camera at that higher resolution. For uh, pose estimation, uh, the number of iterations done for the April tag algorithm to converge on where it thinks the April tag is. And for the margin cutoff, it's just how much the margin detector has before it rejects a tag. And for calibrating the camera, you just need to 3D print the checkerboard. Uh, use something like a ruler, dial caliper, measuring tape, whatever, to verify that what size the squares are. And I would recommend just writing like in a corner here off the grid what the actual size of it is, because you do need to enter that into, uh, for example, um, the software just to, so it knows the size of it. Um, you just have to capture pictures of it on uh, the software to calibrate the camera. You want to get it at different angles, different distances from the camera, and it, use a, it, it it's used to measure the 3D accuracy better. So I have Photon Vision running here on my laptop, and I have a webcam that works with it. A lot of webcams don't, but luckily this one does, so it, it's easy. I don't have to plug in a separate, uh, separate camera. Right here. So after you get it installed and running, you can access it at port 5800. So we have that open. The first thing it'll do, it'll pop up and say, you didn't set your team number. Go to the settings page. So there's a link. You go to your settings page, set your team number. That's so that it can uh, connect to the network table so it can talk to your robot. Um, so then when you're back on the dashboard, you can see over here there's uh, different pipeline settings and different cameras. I only have one camera, so I can only see one. You can have multiple pipelines. So multiple a pipeline has a configuration of how you're going to detect things. So you can have different types of pipelines. You can do reflective tape, which is you know our old reflective tape like you use with a limelight. It can do colored shapes, which we messed around with last year a little bit for the um, cargo detection because there was a circle and it was colored. Um, ended up not using that, but it was something that we tried out and then now April tag detection. So you choose April tag 
And then by default, it'll be in 2D processing mode. Let me see if I make this full screen. You can see a little more. There we go. And that's not my tag. That's this. So the tags need to be pretty flat. So I like to put it on a clipboard. If it gets uh, bent a little bit, it starts to not detect. See, like if we bend it like that. So I put it on the clipboard so that it detects it. So it sees it here and it labels it. This is tag one. If you remember on that first screen, there were 30 different tags. Um, so this tells us this one was tag one. I think I have tag zero here. Yep, tag zero. It sees that one as tag zero. And it will do them both at the same time. Um, then we can do the cool thing. You do the 3D processing and now it can see the orientation that it's turned in both this direction and like this. So there were the settings that we talked about. Those were down here. Um, I just have the default. I've got some the things that we just talked about. Threads of three. So uh, and then at the top, I have to dismiss this. It tells me I'm running at 12 frames per second. So um, I think my camera on here is only 30 frames per second, so I'm not going to be possible to do any better than that. But sometimes if you reduce the resolution or the uh, exposure, you might be able to get better, faster processing. See, now I'm getting up to 15. Um, you can definitely reduce the resolution. This is fairly high. Reduce the resolution. Now I'm getting 30, 31. So that's about the max I'm going to get with this camera. Um, higher isn't necessarily better. Most important is this latency because that's how long did it take to process the image and give you the data. It's nice to have lots of them, um, you know, 30 frames per second, 50 frames per second. A robot runs at 50 iterations per second, so more than that um, you're not getting a ton of value out of, but um, most important is getting that latency low. Um, and then the other thing it shows us here on this output uh, this looks a little different because of screen resolution. Here we go. So it shows me what it sees for the angle and the distance that it is away from the camera. So after we've calibrated, we want to measure and see is it accurate or is it not. Um, so I used a tape measure to do that at home when I was measuring it. Here is where we do the calibration. So on the camera page, you can select the camera that you're using, um, enter your field of vision. I don't know what this one is. 70 was the default, and I just left it at that. But then you choose a resolution. I'm going to choose a lower one. And say that you're going to use the checkerboard. There is down here where you can download the checkerboard to print it. And so I downloaded it and printed it at 100%, no scaling. And then measured on the bottom here you can measure that you know your six inch mark is actually six inches and then if everything prints properly you can leave these at the default it's just it's an eight by eight checkerboard and one inch if you didn't print properly or use a different checkerboard you can do that and then you choose start calibration and it sees the checkerboard you want to make sure that those colors appear and what it's doing is learning about how your camera distorts a picture as it's turned and on the edges and how your lens causes any kind of distortion. So you just want to get it to see it, take a snapshot, get it into a different position, take another snapshot, get it into a different position. And you have to do this up to 12 or 12 or more times. And then it will allow you to save it. There we go, and then I can hit finish calibration, and it says it was successful for that resolution, and then it shows over here all of the resolutions that you calibrated. And somehow I just made that big. Don't know how that works. Wow. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it opened in another tab. Open the stream. I didn't know it did that. So I guess you can click on the picture and you can get a full screen view. 
All right. Any questions so far or any questions about four time vision? Yeah, go ahead. Do you need to do anything special for fisheye lenses and use the SKA thing? They say don't use fisheye lenses okay. for April tag detection. I guess there's a different calibration yep. mechanism for that and they don't support it as of now. Okay. So you can you can run multiple cameras in here, so you could still use that for your other pipelines, or you can have a driver cam. So you can have uh, multiple cameras and you can have one of them in driver cam mode. This will run driver cam. Then that'd be a great use for a fisheye. Okay. Yep. Do yeah. they allow you to input your own calibration if you calibrate it with the fisheye? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Possibly because you can export the settings and then it's like a file okay. and maybe you could edit it and then upload it. I'm not sure. Okay. But they have a Discord that I have a link at at the end okay. and Chief Delphi and the it's an open source software so there's a community that supports it and they're really excited to talk about it. So if, okay. you, if you have questions, you can always ask them. Uh, over here. Yes. Yep. yep. It will for this year, probably not next year, but maybe. So I wouldn't depend on that. Yeah. So we're kind of thinking, we'll talk about a little bit later how the April tags, how you can use that to estimate where you are on the field. Kind of thinking at this point, probably using the April tags to figure out where we are on the field but still using the reflective tape to look at the target? Not sure yet, but depends on what the game is. Yeah. So reflective tape is the same team, not the same tape. That's true. Yep. Both be similar, but might react a little bit more. Yeah. The same weight or pick up that might be in a fair part, because you can't find it. Yep. In, yeah, case, in case you could hear discontinued it, I'm pretty sure yeah. the one we use. Yep. In case you couldn't hear that on the stream, Corey was pointing out that the tape is changing, so make sure you pay attention to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can share the slides uh, with the Jumpstart group and you can get it out there. Yep. Yep. And we're also, on, I'm on Chief Delphi all the time, so you can ask the questions out there too. So, yeah. yeah. Um, have you tried it on anything but the limelight as far as the FPS goes? Yep. What's it's it's been relatively fine. We've done not like a high SF, but, but we've been like just in the medium range of FPS is what we do most of the time. So then you can still get the distance and also the frame rate. We've been usually going like 480 by 320, I think it was. Yep, yep. And this one, um, we had it on a Limelight. It worked pretty well. I've tried it on a Raspberry Pi 4 and a Jetson. The Jetson, it doesn't use GPU, so it's you know just using like a Raspberry Pi. And we can get. I want to say 50-ish frames per second if you yep. turn the resolution way down, but then the detection won't be as far. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, the question was, can you use a limelight to do April tags? You can run yep. photon vision on the limelight, and limelight hasn't made any official announcement yet. There's some talk that uh, Brandon has shared on, <laughs> on Chief Delphi that says, they are adding something, but they haven't really said what. So you can run Photon Vision on it, so that would, that'll definitely be an option, and we have it running on this one. It works pretty well. Expect that probably Limelight is going to release something. Yeah. Any other questions at this point, and then we'll go on. All right. So then, what do you do programming wise you got you have the tags and you can get some information about them but you know what does the program look like so we've got just a little bit of programming here first you add your vendor library um, if you guys don't know how to do that it's built into VS code you have to add it they'll give you a link you put it in now you can see all of the photon stuff that's available um, so you have to go into that UI and get your camera name you can set your camera name if in there as well but you have to know what it is so on that first line there, we've got camera equals new photon camera, and we have to have our camera's name there. Because um, you can have multiple cameras, so you can have multiple uh, instances of this photon camera. And then the next step here, you ask the camera to get the latest results. You have to do that to get the last data. And then we have this result object. And then we can ask that result object, does it have any targets? You have to do that step. If you don't do that step and you ask for targets, you'll get an exception. And you really don't want your robot to, to fail 
because it'll crash the robot. So don't forget to check if it has targets. If it does, um, here we're just saying, give me the best target. So Photon Lib kind of has its algorithm to figure out what it thinks the best target is. Um, you know, you can have multiple tags that you can see. So you can have as many tags as possible. It's going to figure out which one does it think is the least ambiguous, the best option. You can also get a full list of all of them if there's some reason you want to iterate through um, and look for a specific tag or a specific target. And then once you have your target, there's options to get things about the target. So the the yaw pitch and roll. Um, the next slide I have a picture of what that is, but that's the orientation of the tag, like this, like this, like this. Um, so you can get those as well as this get best camera to target. That'll give you a 3D translation. So like that phone over there, I can say it's you know nine meters away. It's turned 30 degrees. It's 90 degrees upright. It'll give me all of that information about from the camera to the tag. So then the question is, well, what do I do with that data? So the basic strategy, this is kind of what we do with reflective tape. You can use the yaw, which is the left and right in the camera. Put your crosshairs in the middle. If the tag is off to the right, well, I need to turn to the right to get the target in view. So left to right is pretty simple. And then for the distance to the target, you can use the pitch. How high or low does the um, target appear? When you're farther away, it gets lower. When you're closer, it gets higher. And then because you know how high off the ground your camera is and the angle that your camera is mounted, you can use just basic trigonometry to get an estimate of how far away the target is. So yaw is side to side, pitch is up and down, and roll is rotation. So that's what we do with reflective tape. Um, I don't expect that this will be real useful with April tags, at least you know this year because you're processing at 30 frames per second. By the time you get to the next iteration of your robot, you still have your old target data, but you're already moving. Um, so it's, it's not going to be as useful for that, but it is an option. Any, I guess any questions so far just about the basic targeting and, and the basic code, and then we'll go on to advanced strategy. All right, so to, to get into the advanced strategy, we need just a little quick background on some of the, the classes that WPI Lib provides. WPI Lib is the framework that we use for our robots. Um, so it has a bunch of stuff built in that can give us geometry and do math for us. So we have a translation. That is a, a point. So in two-dimensional space, that's an x and a y. In three-dimensional space, it's a you know x this way, y this way, and a height. A rotation is that simple on a two-dimensional plane. It's just the yaw, because we don't have any other. In the three-dimensional plane, it's yaw, pitch, and roll. And then a pose is the combination of those two things. So. Um, you know, your robot is on the field, it's two meters toward the next alliance, it's one meter this way, it's turned 30 degrees, and it's, it's standing up right on the floor. So it's uh, pitch and roll usually are going to be 90 and zero. But the tag may not be. We don't know what the tags are going to look like. And on the 2022 field, they were not all mounted flat. And then a transform is what I talked about before, where it's like the distance to that phone and the orientation, the, how it's different from me. So if I'm facing it and it's turned 30 degrees, it, it's kind of like the map to get to that destination. And then there's two-dimensional versions of those, and three-dimensional versions are new for 2023. The, the nice thing about WPI Live is that you know it's got these built in. I can say, I have a pose, I know my robot is here, I have a transform, I can apply the transform to the pose. So I can find out like from, I know I'm on this position on the field, I know the distance and the orientation to that phone, I can figure out where that phone is on the field. So our basic pose estimation, pose estimation strategy. Oh, here we go. All right. 
So this is what the field looks like. Our alliance stations are here along the Y plane and then the X is down field. We know the pose of the tag on the field. We know that FRC is probably gonna tell us that. Um, we don't know if we're gonna be chasing tags. I, I, I doubt at least this year there would be any kind of tag on a robot because it, it can't be bent. Um, so, and what they did in 2022, they were all over the field, if you remember in that uh, picture that we had where you could see the orientations. So we expect they're gonna tell us where the tags are and how they're oriented. And then we know where the camera is on our robot. So this is my little robot. I've got the center of my robot. The camera is here and this is the camera lens. So I know it's, you know, whatever, one meter forward, uh, half a meter off the floor and it's turned at an angle. So this would be a transform from the camera to the robot is what that red line indicates. So then photon vision, when it sees a tag, it'll give us a transform from the camera to the target. So photon vision tells us where the tag is in relation to the camera. So what we're trying to find out is where is our robot on the field? So we can take that transform from the camera to the target and invert it. That's just built into WPI Lab to invert it. And now I know from the tags pose how to get to where my camera is. So because I know where the April tag is, now I can know where my camera is. And because I know where my camera is on my robot, I can figure out where my robot is. So this is where April tags give us more than vision tape. Um, you know, maybe in some of our targets over the years, there have been ones that we know the orientation and we can tell from their size where they are. But in 2022, it was a ring. There was no way to know how you were looking at that ring in your camera. So the strategy would be figure out where you are on the field and where you need to be. So for 2022, you have the big ring target in the middle. If I know where I am on the field, I know exactly how I need to turn to that target to score a cargo. Um, and then WPI Live, they haven't released it yet, but they're planning to provide a capability to to easily figure out if I'm looking at this tag, where is it on the field? They're, they're gonna have a built-in utility class to do that. And maybe it'll even include where the tags are that you won't have to go look through the manual and try to enter that data. So then WPI Lab does all the math for us. Makes it really easy. So any questions on that pose estimation strategy and why we would do that? So then WPI Lab also includes a pose estimator. So we're going to see these tags and as you saw when I had it up, it's not 100% reliable that it's going to see it accurately every time and that it's going to be perfectly right. Um, I had one of those field pictures where it like, thought one of them was turned a different direction than it actually was. So the pose estimator can take those as well as your odometry. So odometry is what we used before where we use our encoders and our gyro to get a pretty good estimate where we are on the field. And that works great during autonomous as long as like nobody hits you from the side and you move. But throughout a match, your gyro drifts a little bit, but your wheels scrub or another robot pushes you or you're against the wall and you spin your wheels. Well, then your odometry gets off and you don't know where you are on the field anymore. So you can use the pose estimator to fuse that with your April tag data to get a better estimate of where you are on the field. And WPI Live has that built in. And you can configure how much you trust the different measurements. Um, you'll have to look up the documentation on how to do that. It's a little bit complex, but you can, you can tune it to say, I wanna trust my odometry more. I wanna trust it less. Maybe I wanna trust my gyro for my orientations, but I wanna trust my April tags for where I am on the field. Um, you can tune all of that. And then there's different variations of that depending on the kind of drivetrain you have. There's differential drive, mechanum, and swerve because they have different dynamics, of course. The, the way that the wheels turn to make the robot move is different for those different drivetrains. So let's take a look at some code. So I 
Is that way too small up there? Kind of. Readable-ish. All right. So this is a pose estimation subsystem. A subsystem will automatically run in the background. Um, so I've got here just two targets that I set up in my garage and where they were on the floor. Now this is where I think WPI Lab is going to make this simpler. And so I only did two of them, but I have to set up my 3D pose for where those tags are. So they're X, Y, and Z. So this way, this way, and up and down. And then their rotation, yaw, pitch, and roll. And I had them hanging on the wall, so their roll and pitch were zero, and they were turned opposite. So I was looking at them when I was at zero, zero, looking at downfield, they were looking toward me. So they're turned 180 degrees. And then I've got my standard deviations, and this is how you can figure how much you trust your different um, components of the pose estimation. So um, we'll just kind of skip over that a little bit, but I've got it where I trust the um, local measurements less because I wanted to, to test out the vision tag. So I could do something like push the robot sideways and see that it would move where the vision thought it was. Um, even though I might not want to actually trust the vision more in a real scenario. Um, so then here's the constructor for the pose drive estimator. I had to look up the example to figure out how to do this. Um, so I took the example and I copied and pasted it in here for the most part. And I already had my swerve code written. Um, so you have to give it what is your current orientation? What are the current positions of your wheels? Where are you on the field? And so I just said I'm starting at zero, zero, which would not be accurate most of the time because you're going to start somewhere in an autonomous position on the field. And then you feed in your um, kinematics, which is your used for odometry. Like, where are your wheels on your robot and how do they drive? And then those standard deviations. So then here's where the fun happens. Periodic automatically gets called every 20 milliseconds by my robot, so 50 times a second. We're going to do what we did in that slide where we get the latest result. And then I can actually get a timestamp of the time when Photon Vision put the data onto the network table. So when it, when it thinks it saw the target, which is nice. That's a new feature of the new network tables so that I can find out. I don't have to do math with latency and make a guess. I can, Photon Vision just tells me this is when I saw it. And then I'm just going to check, is this a new result by checking if it's a new timestamp? Because it, like on my laptop here, I was getting 30 frames per second, but my robot's giving me 50 times per second. So every once in a while, I'm going to get the same data for two iterations, and I don't need to process it twice. And then I'm going to check if it has any targets. If it doesn't, I'm just done. I get out. Um, and then I just grab onto that previous timestamp for later. Then I get the best target, like we talked about. I can now say, which target am I looking at? So the, that ID is, is it, is it um, April tag 0, 1, all the way up to 29, because there's 30 of them. And then I'm just checking the ambiguity. Um, making sure that that looks good and that I have a pose and then um, I'm looking up in that map that we saw at the top where is the target physically on the field so that's just a constant now I know where the target should be on the field and then I get camera to target so that tells me from the camera what is my transform to the tag and then my camera pose is that uh, line that we saw where we know where the camera is on the robot. We're going to invert that so we can get uh, the camera to the target in the other direction, like we flipped that arrow around. And then now I know where my camera is. And then I know where my camera is on the robot. Now I, the vision measurement is an estimate of where my robot is on the field. So that's what the code looks like for that. Um, robot that we had pictured. So we don't have to do 
really any math. WPI Live takes care of all of the math for us. And then the pose estimator, we feed it that information. And it, it doesn't need to know how high we are off the floor. It just needs to know where we are on the XY plane and our yaw. So it uses a 2D position where up to this point we were using three dimensions because the tags were expecting they're probably going to be up off the floor and they can be turned in any direction. So now that we're just on an XY plane, we do 2D and then you tell it what time the data came from. Um, because it's always going to be in the past because you saw the tag, you got the data over the network, and now you're processing it. And the pose estimator automatically can like unwind time and apply that and then redo the calculation. So that's really slick that it does that for you. And then you feed in, just like we do with odometry before, you feed in your gyroscope orientation and your modules, their positions and their state. And so now you can get your current pose from the pose estimator by saying get estimated position. So if you don't feed it any vision, it works just like odometry did before, where it uses rotation and um, encoders to figure out where you are. All right. Any questions on that? Hopefully I didn't lose you guys. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for on the stream, the question was, could you use the April tag data and your position to move your robot autonomously around on the field? And yeah, that's that's why it's really great. If you um, went to the 2022 game at all, you know, the first 15 seconds is autonomous. And so like, we ran a five cargo auto. And so it was very important that we drove where we expected to be because we had to go pick up the cargo off the floor and drive all the way over to the driver station accurately enough for them to roll the ball in. And there was kind of a little ramp there. And if we got too close, the ball wouldn't go in. So we used, there's built in stuff to run trajectories, they call it. Um, so you can use that odometry data today to drive your robot with that odometry data. And then you would instead also use this pose estimator and plug that data in and use those trajectories to just be more accurate where you are on the field. Um, you can also use it, you know, you could just get this pose. Actually, that's what we'll do in the next thing here is I have an example where I'm going to chase a tag. And so the, the robot can follow the tag. So we'll, we'll get into that. It's a little bit um, different where it's not, it's not using that trajectory. It's just saying, where am I? Where do I need to be? Any other questions at this point? All right, so chasing a tag. I was gonna actually drive my robot in here, but I'm a little worried about tearing up the carpet. So instead, I brought a video. And so here, I'm holding the tag on this clipboard in front of the robot, and it's following the tag around. That's not the tag, so this is the tag. And as I you know, move back and forward or rotate the tag, it's trying to stay right in front of the tag turned toward it. So if I rotate like this, it tries to drive the robot around like that. Or if I push it, it tries to go forward and backward. And so you could do this um, you know, kind of like that basic strategy that we said where you can see the tag, you know if it's left or right, forward or backward, but we're gonna actually do it with uh, pose estimation. Yeah. Sure, so the, the question was, what happens if it doesn't see the tag? What would it do? Um, we'll look at the code a little bit, but if it sees no tag at all to begin with, it doesn't start moving. But, yep, yep, if it sees the tag and then it loses the tag, it continues to drive where it saw the tag last. So I actually kind of did some tests like that where I held it up and then hit it behind myself or, or, or covered it up real quick and the robot would drive to where it expected that it needed to be. 
Um, and I did that because you won't see the tag every iteration necessarily, because like you said, you might turn it, or if you, sometimes I would accidentally get my finger over it just a little bit, and that was enough to make it not see it for one iteration. Or, you know, it was in my garage with kind of inconsistent lighting. Sometimes you turn it and you wouldn't get it, or it would, even in this picture, you can see it's rippled a little bit. If it if it's not straight, it doesn't see it. So it, it just said, where was it last time I saw it? I want to keep going there and only update if I see it again. There we go. All right, so much like before, um, we've got our robot on the field. So we can take our pose estimation and we know where our camera is on the robot. We can estimate our camera pose. And now we have our camera pose and photon vision gives us that camera to target so we can so now this is the tag we're trying to chase so i guess the picture is the same as the one before this time we don't know where the tag is on the field because we're going to try to chase that tag so it, it tells us you know from the camera where is the tag so from that we can estimate where the tag is on the field so in the other case, we were going to say, we know where the tag is, so let's flip that around. Now we can know where our robot is. In this case, we know where our robot is because we have our pose estimation. We're going to flip it around to figure out where the tag is. If it's on the wall over there, I know now it's over there. And then we can take where the uh, April tag is, and we can apply just a fixed transform to say, I want to be, you know, three meters in front of that tag. So we create, we have this tag to goal transform, and that's something that's a constant, where it's always I want to be, I want to see the tag 180 degrees, because I'm going to look at the tag, and I want to be straight in front of it, and I want to be, um, you know, one meter away. So now we know on the x y plane, we knew where we were from our pose estimate and we know on the xy plane where we want to be. We could calculate a trajectory and try to drive there, but I went a little bit simpler route where I used a, a profiled PID controller with a trapezoidal pro profile. So that what that actually means is a, a PID controller is something you can use to, to try to get to a target. Um, we won't go into the detail about how to tune it or anything, but it, you can just know that I know I want to be somewhere and it can proportionally integral and derivative inputs to try to get to that target. And the trapezoidal profile gives us um, like a motion profile where it'll accelerate, cruise, and then decelerate. Where if I don't use a trapezoidal profile, it'll just race there. So it would start from you know standing still, race at maximum speed, and then slow down a little bit as it approached. Instead, I want a smooth motion to try to get there. So we used a profiled PID controller. Um, and the constraints on that are configurable. So I can say, how fast does it accelerate? How fast does it cruise? Um, so I can have it safely operate in my garage and not worry about breaking anything. And then there's separate controllers for each X, Y, and yaw. And we're operating just on a two-dimensional plane because we don't care about how high we are off the floor. Or, and our robot isn't going to tip forward and backward. We don't have any control of that. So, so we can look at the code for that. So here's our trapezoidal profile constraints. We have a max velocity and a max acceleration. The velocity is in meters per second, and the acceleration is in meters per second per second. And then we have a omega, that's how fast can we rotate. And that, I believe, is in radians per second, and radians per second per second. So then I had, um, which tag do I want to chase? The, it was ID 2, where this one happens to be 1. It was 2. I had 0 and 1 hanging on my wall to help me know where I was. And then I had 2 was the one that I wanted to chase. And then this is that fixed. Uh, transform where we say where do we want to be in relation to the tag once we see it and I wanted to be one and a half meters in front of it nothing side to side and or up and down 
and then I need it to be pi radians, which is 180 degrees from the target. I want to be in front of the target, not behind it. Now I've got my photon camera, I've got my drivetrain, and my pose estimator is giving me a pose provider just to get where my robot is. And then we have our profiled uh, PID controllers that we passed our constraints and some uh, rudimentary values to make the robot drive. So then my controllers, I can set a tolerance. So I can say, I'm trying to get to a goal. How close to that goal do I need to be before I say I'm at the goal? And I just did 0.2 meters to make that simple and three degrees. So once it's within that, it's supposed to stop. Um, and then because it's uh, you know rotation all the way around and then I can keep rotating, I have to set my rotation controller to be continuous. And it goes all the way from negative 180 to 180 and then it wraps around. So that's just setting that up. Let me just reset everything. And then execute is where we'll see some code kind of like what we had before. So this is my pose estimator that I had before. I'm going to get where does it think my robot is on the field. So we kind of talked about how that works to get to that point. So now we have an estimate of where we are on the field. And that's in two-dimensional space. And I'm going to transform that to three-dimensional space. I know I'm sitting on the floor and I'm going to assume my robot's not tipping over. So my pitch and roll are zero. So those are just to get us into a three-dimensional space because our tag is in three-dimensional space. Oops. So I get that latest result again, check if I have a target. And this is where uh, your question, if we don't have a target, what happens? It just keeps the last target and tries to chase that. Um, this just kind of filters us down to make sure we're looking at the tag that we want to chase and that it's not ambiguous. And then if it's not, we're now we have our target. We're going to hang on to the last target because we need to look at that if we don't have a new target. Now we take where our robot is on the field, we apply that transform to figure out where our camera is on the field because we know where our camera is on our robot. So now we have an estimate of where the camera is on the field. Then we get that transform from our camera to the target and we apply that to the camera position so we now have an estimate of where the target is on the field. So where I'm holding the target on the field, now I have an estimate of that. And then the last step is to say, well, I need to be one and a half meters in front of it, 180 degrees, not rotated. So now my goal pose is in front of that target, one and a half meters. So go back to my picture. Now I have this position and my robot was over here. How do I get from here to here is the next question. So that's where we use our profiled PID controllers. And we say our X controller, the goal is where the target's X is. Our Y is where the target's Y is. And our goal pose and our omega is where we need to be. And then once we have our goals, we can feed in where are we now and the controller will tell us what we need to do to react. So we said, I need to be at this X position. I'm currently at this X position. How fast should I drive along the X plane to try to get there? So I have my separate controllers for X, Y, and Z. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Yep, we're done. So the last thing is take those values, feed them into the drive, and the robot will move. And that was actually... Streaming for this event is brought to you by First Updates Now, who'd like to thank the following fun sponsors. At Kettering University, over 30% of the student population was in high school robotics. These same students have received a portion of over $7 million in scholarships. Scholarship applications for FIRST students are now available. Get more information at kettering.edu slash FIRST. SOLIDWORKS is free for FIRST teams. Over 80% of U.S. engineering schools and 370,000 plus companies use SOLIDWORKS to design great products. SOLIDWORKS can help you design a great robot on desktop or on the cloud. Go to SOLIDWORKS.com slash FIRST to register your team. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. 
keep the conversation going, and provide your input to our content. Watch our live shows at twitch.tv forward slash first updates now. Join our Discord at discord.gg forward slash first updates now, and check out Fun FTC on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and First Updates Now on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter.